Hello everyone, today is Thursday, November 9, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am humbled by your presence, so thank you. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep your questions to what's on the slides while we're in the slides. And then once we get everything covered, feel free to ask about anything. And then once we get to the charts, hold off till we get to the charts, and this is for your benefit to make sure we don't miss any. You can ask about as many stocks as you want, but just ask about one at a time and hit return. And I don't know the tickers for all symbols, so put the symbol in. I do know quite a few though. All right, what do we talk about? Well, I want to do a little update on Bitcoin. I had some, uh, yeah, interesting to me at least, adventures over the week. And the main focus is going to be using discretion to stick with trades. And that'll make a lot more sense in just a minute. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or, as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's do a Bitcoin update, or at least an update from what I've seen over the last week. First of all, let's take a look at the price, and this capture was from this morning. And you can see that it ran up, hit some new highs yesterday, but then has begun to come back in a little bit. It's due for a correction, but so far you can see nice persistent uptrend and somewhat accelerated uptrend or beginning to accelerate higher remains intact. Now, last week I said it really is the wild, wild west, and a couple things happened over the week that I found kind of interesting. So one thing I got to thinking about, I went back and forth with a few of you guys, and my point was don't bet the farm on this, but it's okay to dabble a little bit. Now, when I first started my uh, article, I guess, which I haven't published yet, and I keep uh, revising it, and the presentation came from that last week, the week of charts. Anyway, when I first started it, Bitcoin was down around $4,000. So my argument was, well, if over a year's time you would spend that much on some sort of hobby, let's say you spend 100 bucks a weekend on a golf or doing whatever you enjoy to do or eating out or whatever the case may be, then by all means, feel free to fritter away that amount of money. But now that's seven, eight thousand dollars, that's getting a little bit uh, a little bit extreme. So maybe we need to throttle that back to buy a half a Bitcoin if you wanted to just participate. I would, as I'll say in a minute, I think you're better off trading them, obviously. I believe in trading anything. I don't believe there are any longer term investments, but I think one wouldn't kill you, obviously, except for 100% of whatever you put up. So it definitely is a buyer beware type of situation. And it's it's changing fast and developing fast. Very fascinating. Uh, my experience this week is that these exchanges, you have to realize that when your Bitcoins are, are, are online with someone, they're in potential jeopardy. They can be seen by others, and I'm just beginning to wrap my head around this, but I think that's how it actually works, because if you go to make a transaction, they're able to see they being people out there in the ether are able to see how many coins you have in your account to see whether or not your transaction is legit. So when your coins are on an exchange, then technically that asset is out of your control. And like I said last week, these exchanges aren't regulated. And with a brokerage account, you have SIPC protection, which I think is a half a million now. But it's substantial. It's enough to protect your account from fraud and whatever else happens. And quite a few uh, exchanges over the years, especially when it comes to futures and Forex and such, have gone out of business. So... I use the word exchanges kind of loosely. And one thing I noticed over the week is they don't seem, or at least one of them, doesn't seem to be that robust. 
So I came in yesterday and tried to get to an exchange where I have a token amount of, of, of Bitcoin position. And it was down. And I got the, uh, I think this is a Cloudflare screen. Yeah, it's Cloudflare screen. In fact, I know it is. And then when I was able to get in my account, my positions have or had disappeared. So, and I wasn't too concerned because, again, this is just play money, something I'm just kind of messing around with to learn how it all works or how it doesn't work. But there were no open positions available. And just this morning, I tried to, I was placing some orders, messing around a little bit, and I inadvertently ended up short when I wanted to close out something. And then I was trying to fix that, and it gave me a service busy. So imagine you go to sell a stock. And your broker comes back with, hey, we're too busy. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a little scary. And this is why some of you, rightfully so, uh, emailed me and were quite cautious about it. So I would say tread lightly, but it's something that's definitely worth, worth looking into. Now, here's a couple things, a couple of random thoughts just to kind of wrap this up. Like I said last week, blockchain is going to be bigger than Bitcoin. Blockchain is what allows all of this to happen. And you can watch last week's presentation for a little bit on blockchain. And I'm not a blockchain expert either by any means, but I do or I have begun to wrap my head around how it works. And it's 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 going to change a lot of industries and a lot of businesses throughout. And I had a lot more to say about that last time. Now, you can't directly you'll have to find companies that are using blockchain to capitalize on things. And, and that'll that'll be you'll find those companies through technical analysis and running your scans and such. And the bottom line is we're going to have to just pay attention to what's going on with blockchain again, because it's going to change the way we do business. And I think that we'll have to just keep our eyes open looking for opportunities. And the reason I'm talking about Bitcoin and these things now is that I want to get ahead of it before it got too late. Obviously I think like any other trading vehicle, and I'm making little air quotes in the air for trading, they should be traded. And how should they be traded? Well, with technical analysis, good old fashioned technical analysis, nothing too fancy, no arcane methods, just trend following and have a chair ready for when the music stops, etc. Now, like I said last week, it's going to become more and more efficient. And by that, I mean you're going to have more and more people are going to be playing this market, these cryptocurrencies. And then last week, I mentioned that the XME or CME, CME is actually going to start trading contracts on the Bitcoin. So the more hedgers and speculators and everyone else that gets involved – the more efficient they will become because people will be fighting it out a little bit. By efficient, it's going to become a little bit more choppy or a little bit more difficult to trade. Like Forex. Now, I still trade Forex, and I think there's some wonderful opportunities in Forex, but you have to pick your spots very carefully. The bottom line is I think stocks are still the way to go. If you can find a smaller cap stock that's poised to make a big move, at least make a swing trade move and has the potential to make a longer term move, that's where your your best money is going to be, especially as the Bitcoin becomes more and more efficient. Everyone and their mother is promoting crypto. Seems to me the first peak you buy the pullback. To be the first peak and you buy the pullback. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's going to be the problem. You know, one of the problems with with trends, as I've personally observed, witnessed, felt over the years, is that it, in a real serious trend, it's almost like they never let you in. You know, um, and then when they do, obviously it's the end. So yeah, you need to come up with a plan for. If you wanted to own the token amount, 
as, and I hate to use the word investment, but if you wanted to own the token amount, I think that's fine, provided you're just realizing that you could be frittering, frittering a little money away. But yeah, trading is the way to go. Now, I've been watching some interviews with John McVie, and uh, he's he's an interesting character, <laughs> really interesting character. I'd like to. I wonder if there's a biography on him yet, because um, he's had some interesting experiences in his life, both internally and externally. But one thing he was pointed out is that obviously there's a lot of hackers in all this, and the there are some things that cannot be broken, but it doesn't mean that they can't steal your bitcoins because the blockchain is just the most amazing thing, idea, an amazing thing that I've seen in years. And that sort of, uh, it, it, well, it does. It encrypts everything and kind of makes it like, okay, well, it's safe to buy a bitcoin, but can somebody steal your bitcoin? And believe me, this industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry, this, uh, this hacking and stuff to try to steal your Bitcoins and other uh, information. And one thing that was kind of interesting that he pointed out was that your cell phone is going to be the most vulnerable. And he was talking about people in California who have like 100 grand worth of Ethereum on their phones. And they're like, hey, look at me. I got 100 grand here. Well, Believe me, hackers are working to get that away from you. And you could have a it's it's easier to hack a cell phone and get a virus on a cell phone than it is actually with with a computer. And they could actually what, what's fascinating is they could actually read what's on your screen like a, a snapshot. They could take a snapshot off of your screen. So that's got to be really scared to mess around with them at all on my cell phone. So just. Thought that was kind of an interesting thing he pointed out. Uh, mistakes or carelessness will cost you. So tread really lightly until you get a really good feel for what you're doing. And one thing that I didn't think about that McAfee said is that the inflation in Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general will mean deflation in fiat currencies. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, he's a super bull, obviously, because he owns a huge mining firm, which mines bitcoins. But that is kind of fascinating, though. If you think about it, if one goes up, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that the other is going down. And I never thought about it like that. I don't know. Duh. Common sense. But I just thought that was kind of interesting to point out. All right. One second. Okay, any comments or thoughts on the cryptos before we go any further? And, you know, if you want me to cover something or research something or whatever here, just shoot me an email. Or if you have any uh, comments, I'd appreciate them. All right, let's talk about using discretion to stick with trades. Now, before we get into that, and you've seen this slide a few times if you've been around for a while, but if you're... A little newer to discretion, I thought it'd be a good time to explain the difference between discretion and micromanagement. Now, as you know, I often preach against micromanagement because longer term, it's going to really frustrate you. Now, let's talk about the difference between the two of them. Discretion, if I had to defined it define it it's using your brain and common sense to generally improve performance and micromanagement is abandoning the original plan in attempt to outsmart the market so one you're you're using your brain and saying okay well the stop on this is nine dollars the stock is trading at $8.99. Yes, technically the stop has been hit, 
I need to think about exiting. If it keeps dropping, I have an uncle point in mind. I will get out. But let's just see if this is just a little opening gap aberration or a little bit of a spike or whatever's happening. And if it is, then I'm going to stay with the position. If it isn't, I'm willing to take my lumps and move on. Micromanagement is abandoning the original plan and attempt to outsmart the market. You get in a, a stock and it goes against you a day or two or even one afternoon right after you get in it. And you say, well, you know, the market's up. And this stock is down, so something's wrong. I better get out. And then, of course, what happens is you watch in anguish as it turns around and takes off without you, either later that day or later next week or the week after. Now, the thing about micromanagement is it can often pay over the short term, but it never pays longer term. And as I often preach, the market could be a really, really bad teacher. So what I'm saying here is let's suppose that Let's suppose you get in a position right here, and it goes up a little bit, then comes back in. You're like, you know what? Screw this. Let me just get out. Okay, let's say that happens again. Comes back in. Screw this. Let's get out. And you might do this several times in a row, and you only lose a small amount of money. Or on the flip side, let's just say market goes up. You got a nice little profit. Then it begins to roll over. You decide, you know what? Screw this. My stop is like, let's say your stop is here. You know what? I'm just going to go ahead and take my money. So your equity curve will probably look like this with the micromanagement. And without the micromanagement, it'll probably look something like this. Okay. But what will happen is eventually you're going to micromanage yourself out of a big winner. And then your equity curve will look like this as opposed to like this. And it's hard. It's it's hard because the short term can often tempt you to do the wrong thing. And the longer term is where the money is. And the longer term is where we want to be. And that goes for the process in and of itself. Short term following the process can often suck. Because you will get stopped out in positions that you're thinking, you know what? I knew I should have gotten out of that. And that's just human nature. And by the way, I don't want to digress too far, but one thing I've been studying a lot of, about lately, and it's been confirmed by several uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, uh, Dorn would be one of them. I'm trying to think of the other guys who, who have written about it. The more I study this, the more I find the, the backing to it. But a, a loss has a two to two and a half times emotional response, two and a half times according to Janice Dorn that a gain does so let's say you lose a thousand dollars that is going to create an emotional response that's going to be two and a half times the emotional response of actually making a thousand dollars and that's what makes things tough and not to digress too far i know haha good luck with that right you a longer term trend comes in mind and let's say you you get into a trade and you take a little swing profit off and it corrects a little bit and it goes on to make a longer term nice trend let's say you got in right here and then you got your trailing stop in place and in the end it does something like this well in a recent example i think it closed out at like 180 percent or whatever We've had a few over the years, right around 150, 180, 200, whatever. The human nature is to look at this part right here, because when this happened recently in a position, I got quite a few emails and people that were looking in and who weren't actually trading. Actually, you know, the, the emails universally said, ouch. It's like, OK, well, yeah, that's because this emotional response is two and a half times stronger than a, like a similar gain. And mentally monetizing the profit way up here can also hurt you too. That's a different conversation altogether. But that's one of the reasons why 
trading is so hard. And, and as I've been preaching, the more I and deeply I get into the psychology, the more I understand the way I feel like I do. And I thought it was just me with these feelings, but it's actually from both a physiological standpoint and a psychological standpoint, too. So that micromanagement of the short term will stop a lot of pain. But longer term, it's going to create angst when you're missing the bigger trends. <laughs> micro, macro, long, short, up, down. Just give me the perfect... Just give us a perfect methodology that will lead to eternal profitability. You know what, Howard? If I had that, you'd never see my fat ass again. <laughs> and as I as I talked about in trading full circle and in psychology, the one thing that that uh, messes with your head is that all these people are out there putting out these inflated with these inflated claims claiming that you can make all this money. And then in one case, one example I use was someone said, well, you can make two to 4% a day. Well, a 10% account, I'm sorry, a $10,000 account would be worth $180 million at the end of the year. Now, if I could turn 10,000 to 180 million by the end of the year, you'd probably never see my fat ass again. I love what I do and it's a lot of fun and I do a lot of things that I'm not completely altruistic, but a lot of things I do on the educational side aren't profitable in that I help people and don't always make money off of doing that. But I enjoy the process. But if I had that holy grail, I wouldn't be selling it for 500 bucks if I could make $180 million in one year. So, yeah, that's part of the problem that's out there. Before I digress too far, I know too late. Russ says, would you say longer term, can you put a rough time frame on that, please, like a year or 10 years? Well, long term in a position or long term trading? Long term trading, I mean long term as a trader, long term as a career, as a trader, and especially if you're trading momentum, might be six months, eight months, a year or longer where you have to stomach either minor losses or minor gains and, and maybe not even making the whole lot over a period of time, but continuing to follow that process. Now, during that, let's just use one year as a baseline and provided you have experience before that one year. But during that one year, let's say you start micromanaging and you save money on 10 positions. Either you capture an open gain that evaporates soon thereafter, or your losses are much smaller than they should be. And let's say you do that for six to eight months, and you haven't made a whole lot of money, but you certainly didn't lose as much money as you would have following the process. Well, as soon as that outlier trade comes along, and I hate to make it sound too elusive, and I've been criticized for that uh, because I do make it sound elusive, but it can be very elusive. I don't know when the next big winner is coming along. When, it, when I'm complaining to my wife about being a drawdown, she's like, well, when are you going to get out of it? It's like, well, I wish I knew. I don't. But it always seems to come along eventually where you have the nice big couple of winning trades. The point is that if you micromanage yourself, you'll never catch that big winner. Now, the discretion will help you to stay with the position. Now, with trading, is always a trade-off. If you forget about discretion for a second and just think about it, if you use looser stops, you are more likely to catch a trend because you won't get shaken out as much. Unfortunately, when you do have a loss, you'll lose more money on that position, provided, of course, that you haven't compensated by trading fewer shares. All right, let's take a look at a – when you say micromanage versus long-term. Understood. Follow the process is the answer, it seems. Yeah, yeah. The answer is always following the process. And and that's the tough part is following the process. And I, and I didn't know why – and again, this is where it's kind of like a, a peeling the onion – or however you want to look at it. But the more I learn about this, the more it makes me feel somewhat normal. 
because it's like, well, wait a minute. I just realized recently after doing a little research, and this comes from Steen Barger, and I talked about this in recent columns and a, a recent week in charts. It's like the planning phase is done by the logical part of your brain and most of your whole brain. And as uh, Curtis Faith says, at least you have time during that phase, or if you give, I, or I'm kind of mixing up the two guys here, but Curtis Faith talks about left brain, right brain. At least while the market is closed and you're doing your analysis, if you if your gut feel or your right brain says this looks like a good position or a good to take a good setup, then as Curtis Faye says, you could send it over to your left brain for confirmation from the logical side. As a general statement, your logical side is doing the most most of your planning, and then you're using the emotional side a little bit to kind of verify everything. But when you're in an actual trade and you're trying to follow the process, that becomes much harder because the more primal part of your brain down there in the, what's it called, the lizard brain, or also known as the old brain, the very much smaller part of your brain down in your amygdala and limbic system and all that, takes over. And that's where you get into a lot of trouble because you make these emotionally charged decisions. And the secret to following that process, if there is a secret, is to just take a deep breath, relax, and go back and look at what the original plan is. And if you decide you're going to abort that plan, then by all means, make a note as to why. Now, micromanagement obviously is aborting the plan, but discretion is not really aborting the plan, but more like, oh, I'm going to make a minor little tweak here. I know the stop's at 9 the stock's at $8.99. I'm going to just give it a little bit of room here. Now, I'm not going to throw caution to the wind and watch it go to 8 and then 7 and then 6 and then 5 and 4 and 3 and 2 and 1 and lose all my money on the position. I'm going to watch it like a hawk when it's down there right around that stop and decide whether or not I want to stick with it or not. Now, let's take a look at a, a current example. And I wanted to do this last week, but I got uh, I got distracted because I wanted to get in front of Bitcoin with Bitcoin making the new highs like it has been. Anyway, long story endless. Uh, this is CRC, and these are the parameters up here that were published back in October, early October. And you can see here's the entry, and this was the protective stop. And the initial profit target was here. Now, this was coming off of major lows. Now, if you fast forward to recent trading, you could see that it did trigger the entry and then began to meander. And then it went down and just dipped right below that stop. And then by the end of the day, it turned around and then begin to take off over the next few days. So the point is that the incremental loss of saying that you have an uncle point down here somewhere, the incremental loss of this is very small, bigger picture, as opposed to the potential gain by sticking with a position. Now, I always have to back this up with a caveat, getting back to following the process. If you're new or newer to trading, then by all means, use that, that point as a hard stop to where you actually get out, no questions asked. And once you prove that you have the discipline to do that, then move into discretion. Discretion is kind of like trading 2.0 is where this, this is where you become – better what you're doing you're getting a little further up that maslow's ladder self-fulfillment or whatever freshman psychology ruin its ugly head and you're doing this little minor tweak or tweaks to improve your performance now this is kind of hard to say but even if you're losing money and you're following the process to a t then you've proven you can be a trader 
you don't really prove that you could be a trader by becoming the best stock picker or inventing the best system in the world. I think you could prove that you could be a trader by following the plan. And that's the that's the true litmus test for a trader. Now, the bottom line is like, well, did you make money or not? Yeah, that's the money comes the money comes later. It's the process that's important and sticking to that process day after day after day. And that's the hard part is is doing that. But once you prove that you can follow the process, and this is why I tell people. Just find something really simple and stick with it. Like just trade one pattern, such as persistent pullbacks with TKOs. And you can get those under videos on my website. And do that until you get good at it and then begin to move on to other things, provided, of course, you can follow the process. And if you can't follow the process, all you have to do, I know it's like my wife, you know, all you have to do this faucet's leaking all you have to do is just tighten up a little bit you know click click and you're done well it's it's never that easy you know <laughs> trading is a lot like plumbing it's never that easy but all you have to do is follow the plan for just one trade okay and if you can't do that then reduce your share size down to where you just take a trade that's almost meaningless to you to where if you stop out of it It'd be no more you'd spend for a weekend of entertainment or something like that. And if you can't do that, especially at a very small amount just for one trade, then you have to do a little introspection and decide whether or not this trading thing is for you. And I'm not a tough love kind of guy, but sometimes you do have to reach that point where you do that introspection, decide whether or not I can follow the process. When I tell my wife about these things that happen, such as this CRC trade and one another one recently, you know, he's, your wife could always ask tough questions and all. For you guys who aren't married, it, it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting experience for you because your wife can always ask a really tough and obvious question that you don't always have an answer for. Like I said a few minutes ago, like okay, you know, drawdown. When will you come out of the drawdown? I was like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> but she, uh, when I told her about the, the CRC trade more specifically and how it actually nicked that stop, and it really bums me out, worried about my people getting taken out of it right before it takes off. She says, well, you're often right, but early. Is there something you could do about that? Well, have you guys seen The Big Short? It was a phenomenal movie. If you haven't seen it, you need to see it. I would encourage you, at least the first time you watch it, don't watch it with someone who doesn't know trading because they're going to ask you a bunch of questions and you're going to have to explain to them what's going on. You're going to miss half the movie. And if they don't ask you a bunch of questions, you're going to feel like they're missing half the movie and then you're going to explain to them and then you're going to miss half the movie. So watch it first time through and then just wait if you're with someone who doesn't know trading to ask the questions and then answer them but it reminded me of the big short when michael berry was had this big position and he was confronted by one of his big investors and he said i may have been early but i'm not wrong well that's the same thing as being wrong, Michael. That's the same thing, Michael. So it reminds me of that. And I guess the road to ruin in Wall Street is being right but early. And this is especially true with a transitional type of pattern. So to answer her question, is there something you can do about that? Well, obviously, discretion, and that's the majority of this presentation today. And discretion will help you stick with trades. And it will also help you in other ways, such as if you're nearing an initial profit target and the market just can't seem to get there, then by all means, take the initial profit target. You're not aborting the entire methodology. You're not aborting the process. You're just adding a small layer onto the process to make it work better. 
Now, I don't suggest you watch a screen all day long. If I watch a screen, I will make trades. I've been guilty lately with, this, with these cryptocurrencies. It's funny. When, uh, I used to be like that with Forex because I, I just watched every little tick with Forex. And I fire off a bunch of unnecessary trades. Now, I don't watch Forex that much anymore. I have a screen, obviously, on at all times. But I check it a couple times a day. Okay, maybe a few more than a couple. But I'm not sitting there watching it. But right now, it's like I'm watching this Bitcoin and other cryptos go crazy. And I think I'm firing off a little too many trades. I need to kind of back off a little bit. It's kind of like a new toy. I'm just messing around with it. So, again, I would encourage you not to watch a screen all day because that will get you into trouble, no matter what level you're at, I believe. But you could do things like set alarms. And when an alarm triggers, and maybe set it near where the stop would be. Let's say the stop is here. Set an alarm maybe here. So if the market hits that alarm, you'll know that action needs to be taken. And the other thing, too, is if you're coming into the day, and let's say your stop is like right here, and let's say the stock is here the day before, you know there's a pretty good chance that it might open below that stop or at least hit that stop right around the open. So keep an eye on the open, and you're going to find that about 90% of the discretion will occur, will occur there. Now, you don't have to watch the screen all day, but usually within the first half hour or so, you'll know whether or not some discretion is going to be necessary, and usually within the first five minutes. And then you can go about your life. So if you do have a little control over your career to where you can carve out those few minutes around the open each day, and probably 99.9% .9 of the time, or at least 99% of the time, there won't be any action to be taken. So you won't even have to sit there for the first 30 minutes or anything, or even the first five minutes. You can go about your life. Now, being right but early is going to occur a lot more on transitional type of setups. New trends, emerging trends. So let's say a market bottoms out and you've got a really nice little bow tie, cup and handle type of pattern or first thrust or whatever the case may be, kind of like the CRC was. Then you could say, well, this looks like the mother of all bottoms. I think this thing is going to go to the moon. This is what I think, okay? Well, a lot of times it might not be through bottoming out before it does. So you could be right but early. And sometimes you'll end up taking more than one stab at a position. In a case like this, it just kind of took off again. It was hard to jump back in. And you could end up chasing your own tail if you're not careful. But if a lot of times I'll have positions, especially like at Forex, if I'm looking at like an hourly chart, and this is on a major, let's say this is a major, major high, and I get a bow tie, well, sometimes I get stopped out a couple times, and then the real trend does emerge. So you can be right but early, but you have to lick your wounds. I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to, let's say you're shorting something and it goes to new highs or you're long something and it goes back to new lows, then you have to be willing to get out, take your lumps. So again, you got to be careful with transitional setups because you often will be right but early, but you have to be careful not to allow being prudent to become being obstinate. So let's go back to see if we can get it to come up without too much. It might not be easy. Okay, so right here, you could say, I know that this is the mother of all bottoms. And we'll take a look at the longer term chart here in a second. It'll make a lot more sense. But I know that this, this, is, this, is, this stock is bottomed out. I just feel it. Well, you can't say, okay, I'm right, but early and follow it down into oblivion, okay? Now, the other thing to do, especially if you're in a transitional setting, is to take a view from 10,000 feet. And by that, I mean, okay, you're looking to get long this stock. This is the CRC once again. And this is kind of a phoenix type of pattern. By that, I mean it's bottomed out longer term. It looks like it has the potential to make a substantial move from here because it's had a couple of years of bottoming out. So if you squint your eyes or back that chart way out, 
this little move in here is very insignificant when you look at the bigger picture. So when you go to apply that little bit of micromanagement, give it an extra few cents on a position right on the stop, that's okay, or it's a lot easier, I should say, when you were taking a view from 10,000 feet. So back the chart out a little bit and gain perspective. Okay, why am I in this position? Where well, we're looking to be, looking to catch a big bottom. Yes, I might be right, but early I will bail out if it does continue to go against me, but it still looks okay from a bigger picture standpoint. Now, if you're sitting there watching it, and you're watching every little tick or every little bar, then all of a sudden it looks like this, and you lose a perspective of that longer term chart. Boy, a lot of uh, a lot of comments coming in. It's good to see you guys paying attention. Hey girls. All right, let's see what you guys are saying. Watching screens. Ooh, flashing lights, bells. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, that's why I know I preach this, but that's why I keep myself so busy. I mean, I lay in bed four and five in the morning and finally get up around five thirty. You just overwhelmed with how much I have going on. But that keeps me out of a lot of trouble. For discretionary trading, how do you deal with the inevitable F bomb when a stock is a huge overnight gap and blows right through the hard stop? Well, I've covered that quite a bit. So let me just give you let me just give you the readers digest. But if you look at the YouTube my YouTube channel, uh, you'll see quite a quite a few on that. Let's say you got a stop here and the next day the stock opens down here. Well, if it opens like here and then turns around so it's going up, then you could say, okay, well, let me just let me have an uncle point in mind, and if it goes back down, takes me out, then I'll get out. But a lot of times, this is called damage control, and this has happened recently in something. It escapes me at the moment, but I saw this happen on a position not too long ago, and it could be quite frustrating to have a big opening gap against you, and then by the end of the day, it could be all the way back up here. Not every day, not all the time, but here's the deal. Once again, we're talking about an incremental additional risk. You already have the loss, and I learned this from my futures broker from day one because you got to deal with a lot of uh, gaps in futures contracts and commodities. And he pointed out to me, he goes, well, Dave, you already have the loss. You know, the bomb's already blown up. How could you, how could you improve upon the situation? Now, that takes discipline because sometimes you get a gap lower, and then what happens? The market continues to implode. So that's how we handle that, Donald. And uh, again, the YouTube channel, there's going to be a lot there. Margin call. Oh. Actually, not a margin call. I can't take that, though. Now, uh, just another question about longer term. Ideally, I often, when people say, uh, how long do you stay with positions, which are average holding time, and I often say, hopefully, 10 years or longer. So hopefully, you get into position. I know you said the word hope, but hopefully, you get a position, you take a swing trade, and then you're able to stick with that position longer term after you take partial profits. Dave Light, the simple indicator to stay on the right side of the market. Great article. Perfect. Makes methodology, makes the most sense to me. Yeah, I just wrote an article for a proactive, a little one-page article. Um, every now and then they ask me to do a, um, a contribution to that. Wait, I just talked about the daylight, or as one of you guys uh, mentioned, it, Dave Light is what we call it now, where the low is greater than the moving average. And it was a... Uh, Pretty exciting. Tom McClellan actually tweeted it out to uh, to his people. And even Tom thought it was cool. So that's uh, very um, very excited about that. When you say micromanage versus long term, okay, yeah, we answered that. Okay, all right, follow the process. Okay, you got it. Go, oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's a problem. Sometimes I go off on these tangents when I'm answering questions. <laughs> Is that Publishers Clearinghouse calling? I hope not. 
No, I hope so. Wait a minute. Which one? All right. One more example. Deja vu all over again. Now, this wasn't a transitional setup. This is one we've been hanging on to forever. And the stop, as you can see here, was, if I can get my pen to work again, was at 15. And yesterday it went to 14.97. It's like it reminds me we had one stop was at 9. And the stock went to 8.99. It had one 200 share trade. That's what, $1,800 on a, <laughs> not even $1,800 on, on the stock. And that was the low tick of the day. There was only one trade there. In some of these cases, it could actually be a fat finger or something when it's that close, right? And the stock was traded substantial volume. So 200 shares is just, you know, in the wind, right? They traded 899. Then somebody in the webinar, when I pointed this out, the stock went on to like 30 bucks a share afterwards, of course. They said, well, Dave, why don't you just place your stop, your original stop at 899? It's like, well, if I was that good, it could get it down to the penny. Once again, you'd never see my fat ass again. But trading is not a game of exacts. But anyway, we had this one here. The stop was at 15. It went to 14.99 as a low. And then by the end of the day, as you can see, it was way up here. So a little discretion could help keep you with a position. Now, obviously, in trading, is always a trade-off. So you have to make decisions and live with them as I preach. And the living with them is hard. And the reason the living with them is hard, it goes back to all those things I just said about the brain earlier. There's a lot of different emotions and part of your brain that comes out, that comes into play when you're doing the living with it part. And that's the tough part. So what could happen is, let's say you don't allow that stop to take you out because it only went one penny past. And come on, you know, one penny markets aren't exact. We know that. And then the next day to stop gaps down low gaps way down and now you're staring at a big loss you can't go back and say wow i wish i would have gotten out now so you have to live with what whatever decision that you make now it's okay not to use discretion again if you're newer to trading then you actually get more points for saying you know what i just let the stop take me out i'm that's fine i know longer term i'm going to do just fine maybe i'll miss this move if it does reverse but I'm okay with that because I'm just learning and I'm Dave told me to follow the plan for just one trade and I'm going to do that and make sure I could do that before I take my trading to the next level and introduce this discretion. <laughs> Tangents to the best part. Russ. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, I always tell my wife, it's like I say the same thing every time. Like when she's home, I'll go in the house and she'll be like, how'd it go? Yeah, I rambled a lot, but I think I brought it all back together. And um, I said something about that once and somebody emailed me and said, no, keep rambling, Dave. We get more out of your rambles than what you're trying to tell us directly. So I know it probably drives some of you nuts. <laughs> All right. So a couple of random thoughts on discretion. I think I've already said this a few times. Unfortunately, markets don't move on exacts. Again, if I could figure that out, then you'd never see me again. It does require a lot of discipline. And you sometimes you have to take your lumps, and then sometimes you might have to take your lumps the next day or the day after. It happens, spell with a silent SH. The bottom line is keep the eye, keep your eyes on the big prize. And I mean this in two different ways. If you're trading a transitional type of setup off a major multi-year bottom in a stock that was 90 bucks a share a few years ago, and it's down around nine bucks a share now, then just say, wait a minute, let me just give it a little bit of room here because maybe it's not through bottoming out before it takes off and goes back to 90 bucks a share. And if you're trading any other pattern, just realize that, well, the big money is if I can maybe get 10 points or 20 points out of this trade, a double or triple or whatever the case may be, 
that's a lot of money compared to this incremental loss that I would take on if it continues to drop and I have to get out a little bit past my stop. So the big money is in the longer term trend. The big money is in the longer term big moves. The big money is in those outliers. And I hate to make them sound elusive, but they can be tough to catch sometimes. And if you and I did the math years ago, and it seems like this is confirmed from a lot of other people. In the longer term, in longer term trend following, you're only going to be right at max, maybe 28 percent of the time. That's pretty abysmal if you think about it. So over 72% of the time, you're going to be wrong. And my only way to compensate or solve for that problem is to take partial profits and then trail that stop and then gradually let it loosen up. All right, uh, this was left over from the last few weeks. Let me just throw it in real quick. There's been, there's been some imminent top, bleh, imminent top fear mongering that's happened. And over the summer, I said, winter is coming. And I made a little joke about that bastard Jon Snow. But the fear mongering, I wouldn't get too excited, not just yet. Predict early and often seems like what a lot of these people have been doing. And I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus because I could be wrong quite a bit too. But as a trend follower, I've just kind of given up and I just follow along and be a trend following moron. Stops will take me out when I'm wrong. If I get some setups on the short side, then maybe I'll start taking some. But I don't want to call a top. But Dave, weren't you kind of bearish over the summer? I was, but I was pointing out, simply pointing out that the market had lost steam, the Russell 2000 had bow tied down on the daily, and that we had to pay attention. Maybe make sure we honor our stops, maybe become a little bit more selective on the long side and possibly consider a short or two. That's not saying it's the end of the world, and as some people I've been seeing lately, a 30-year top. Well, we'll see. But I've known some people out there, and they should know better, who have been calling a major top since, like, last October. I guess you know, it's the same thing, Michael. <laughs> Maybe you're right, but you're, like, really early. And if you're betting on a bet like that, you can get into a lot of trouble. All right, let's take a look at any remaining questions and then we'll hop into the charts. Okay. Craig says that in, let's take a look at that real quick because it's relative. You guys want to start asking about individual question, uh, individual stocks. I'll be happy to cover those now. Craig says SQ was in it out at 28. Okay. Yeah, his point is that he got knocked out here, and I don't know where your stop was, but I'm assuming it just was an incremental loss from there. And that incremental loss from somewhere around here, from there to there, is nothing compared to this gain like this, okay? Now, again, you got to have an uncle point. At some point, you got to say, okay, let me just scratch out, lick my wounds, and... Okay, I lost a little more than I intended to, but that's okay. I can move on and find the next big opportunity. What's the old saying? Be shaken, not stirred. LXU did that today. LXU, LXU. What did it do? Open gap reversal. I'm not seeing it. All right. Let's take a look at the overall market. Let's take a look at some sectors, and then we'll start uh, looking at your stock picks. Keep them coming, so we'll have a few queued up. S&P 500 getting hit a little bit today, down about three quarters of a percent. I think that the market could use a correction. I think that's okay. So I'm not going to get too excited just yet. Just in case Phil's here, which he is, let's throw the 50-day moving average in there. Now, I only use the 50 when – usually I only use the 50 when the market begins to sell off fairly hard. As we'll see in the Russell, as Phil pointed out this morning, we'll take a look at it there because it's actually there. But you can see this market's been doing fairly well. The article I did, by the way, was on Daylight. 
I guess I'll call it Dave light. And again, as I said earlier, that's simply the lows are greater than the moving average. And it's pretty amazing that that in and of itself, as you can see, most of the lows were above the moving average. Most of the lows above the moving average. You can see that play out. Most of the lows above the moving average has room between the lows and moving average. We had, what, a couple days here. Now, my point is you don't want to buy and sell every time you have daylight to the upside, daylight to the downside, or you'd probably end up chasing your own tail. And I wouldn't suggest you trade it mechanically either, but paying attention to it can really help to keep you on the right side of the market. And my point was I did a – you can get the article off my website, so there's no sense to reinvent the wheel. But if you look at the article, uh, it's kind of interesting on a weekly basis. And you back the chart way out, again, a view from 10,000 feet. You could see that we had some incredible bull and bear markets just with that 50-day, or in this case, 50-period, 50 50-week 50 moving average. And again, you don't want to buy and sell every time you got a, a daylight crossing, but it's worth paying attention to. Okay, Andre says, do you use any fundamentals at all? Andre just said the F word. No. Zero. Zero. I wish I had, you know, I need, to, I need to queue up a few good quotes on that. But fundamentals suggest what a market ought to do. And technicals suggest what the market is doing. So technical is, is what it's doing and fundamentals is what it should do. And I think you can get into a lot of trouble with fundamentals. Now, if you do want to incorporate fundamentals, that's fine, but make sure the market agrees with your, your research. Let's say a stock is headed straight down, but you think it's a good stock. Well, if, if you believe in fundamentals and the fundamentals, fundamentals may be fantastic, then as that stock continues to drop, then you should buy more. Well, at what point are you going to follow that stop, stock into bankruptcy? So the market is the final arbiter. What is, is. And I actually bought the domains. Don't confuse the issue with facts and do not confuse the issue with facts. I don't know. I used to have this fetish where I bought a bunch of domains. Every night I'll still buy another one. That's a bit of a sickness with me. I should probably unload them all. <laughs> anyway, uh, but yeah, don't confuse the issue with facts. Now, that's what makes a market, okay? Different opinions, and and that's fine. If you want to use fundamentals, if you if you can make it work for you, then do it. It's just not my cup of tea. All right, let's take a look at the Nasdaq. As you can see, pulling back a little bit today. I wouldn't get too excited just yet, okay? I guess the next point is where would you get excited? Well, if we pull back into this prior base, which would be for Phil, if he's keeping score, which would be below the 50-day moving average, then I would begin to get a little bit concerned about the overall market. In case you didn't realize it or from earlier in the presentation, the point is be really, really careful with your big picture prognostications, okay? Don't worry about catching the top. Leave that to the gurus. And like I said, there was one in particular, and I wouldn't throw anybody under the bus, but it was last October. And then going into that, going into that uh, slide we had in 2016 was uh, super bearish. No, no, I'm sorry, this one here. I mean, this guy was calling tops for months and months and months and months. And then right here, he's like, you see? I nailed it. I got it. It's like, well, you've been calling a top <laughs> since 2,500, and you think you called the mother of all tops. And then, of course, the market has obviously rallied substantially from there. Anyway, I digress too far. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. We got the 50 in here for Phil. The Russell 2000 has pulled back to the 50-day moving average. Does it mean that that's the end of the world? But it does give you a reference point. And if you've been following along in the trading service of the weekly charts, you'll notice that I've been talking about, if you look at a little bit longer term chart on the Russell 2000, 
you could see this whole thing just looks like a pullback. And, and to me, this actually looks constructive in here. So I sort of like the fact that this Russell 2000 is correcting. If it pulls back into this longer term base, then obviously I pull my horns in and get a little concerned. But so far, so good. Let's take a look at some sector action. I'm bullish on the energies. Uh, they had a bit of a shakeout before they took off, and now they're pulling back again. I think we can find some opportunities here. Uh, one of the problems that I am seeing with some of those low-level stocks, stuff that looks like CRC, is a lot of those stocks do have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. So you got to take them on a case-by-case -case basis. But the energies look pretty good. They're just off a of multi-year highs, pulling back a little bit, as you can see. Now, banks are looking a little dubious, and especially if you get into, like, the regional banks. They're doing a little bit worse than banks overall. Now, banks were doing okay not that long ago because rates were creeping up, and I think banks do better at higher rates. I guess it's a spread thing or something. But you can see banks have pulled back to right around the prior breakout point and somewhat below it. So that's a little concerning in here. But most areas are doing pretty good. You can see insurance is just off of these all-time highs. The REITs have come back strongly. Not that I want to run out and trade real estate because it tends to be lower. They tend to be lower in volatility and not something that I'm very excited about trading. But you can see real estate's doing pretty good in here. And that's probably because bonds have uh, taken a bit of a breather from their slide and have worked their way higher today, notwithstanding. Now, bonds down, rates up. Bonds up, rates down. That's how that works. Now, getting back to the dubious and the downside, take a look at the drugs. You can see we still have a daily bow tie down here. Bow tie is just when the moving averages come together, begin to spread out. See the free reports uh, in my store. You have to walk through the gift, gift store to get to the uh, free stuff, but it's down at the bottom, I promise. Get the report on that. But you can see... Bow tie down off uh, fairly major highs in here. Yeah, multi-year highs. That's usually a signal you want to pay attention to. I wouldn't say it's the end of the world, but it's suggests that they are somewhat dubious. Take a look at Biotech Within. Same sort of action there, too. Uh, shorter term, a lot weaker than drugs themselves. What's concerning, now I'm still seeing a couple of biotechs that look okay, but what's concerning within the biotechs, and some of these other areas is that there are some debacle de jours out there, meaning stocks that have gotten torpedoed overnight. Now, this is this is a health service stock, but it's one that let me give you an example of what a debacle de jour looks like. This was one on a lander list not too long ago. I didn't say rush out and short it, but I just pointed out the fact that it looked like it was in trouble. And this is what I mean. Jump it dropped from 19 down to 14 overnight. Kind of a ugly move there. Unless, of course, you're short. As you would expect, let's take a look at health services real quick. Health services looked a little weak not that long ago. But they're back up towards new highs, so that's certainly a good thing. Um, medical appliance and equipment, not too far from new highs within the health service. What else is happening? Some of these areas like manufacturing, obviously pulling back a little bit today, but so far still in a longer-term uptrend looking okay. A lot of these technology-related areas, telecom notwithstanding, still doing pretty good today notwithstanding, obviously. But I think this could provide an opportunity if this market weakens. And that's one of, that's been one of my problems lately. If you're trading pullbacks, then you're not going to get many pullbacks or many meaningful pullbacks when the market is at or near new highs. Okay. So, But again, most technology looks pretty good. I like the semis quite a bit. And then telecom is a big exception in technology, not looking so hot. Now, let's take a look at, uh, all right, we'll start looking at your individual stock picks now. Andre says, a case study on Kim. Um, well, Kim, as you know, you had this TKO back here, and we took partial profits, and then we trailed the stop higher. And I think it was around 18 or so where it stopped out. So it was still a decent move from there to there, whatever that turned out to be. And, yeah, it did gap down overnight and did not turn around. But believe it or not, the stop was pretty far away. The stop was like in here somewhere. 
So even though that's a very dramatic to come in, and, and you know what? I dropped some F-bombs, okay? <laughs> I'm in a separate structure, so my wife doesn't hear the F-bombs so much, but we're considering downsizing because we don't need two houses and six acres, you know? Uh, so she's going to she's gonna see a different side of me. <laughs> but yeah, you know, drop an F-bomb, but in reality, it happens, and that's just part of the – comes with the territory – and you could see that there there have been some pretty good corrections along the way while it made its way higher. And then eventually, as I preach, it ends badly. Okay. Could you throw a 50-day moving HV50 moving average on them? Uh, I can't throw a – I can't – on the fly, I can't put, a, put an HV on that. But um, I'm not sure where you're going with that. But here's the thing, and I've done presentations on this too. If you're trading properly, you get a spike. Not only do you get the acceleration in trend, but you also get the acceleration in volatility. So that's one reason that your stop is going to have to become wider and wider to stick with that second low for the position. That's a little bit more advanced than I want to get into today. Uh, but, yeah, I've done presentations on increases. Uh, if you dig around, my go to davelander.com slash videos, and I have some videos uh, under weekend charts where I covered the volatility increase with uh, positive positions, okay? TNTR, Dave Light and Transitional Trades. The more, the more I work, the luckier I get. Who's that? Uh, Mark Twain. Um, yeah, this hasn't really made. This is one you were emailing me about this one. Um, I don't like the fact that a gap down here. I don't like all this overhead supply. So for me, this stock would actually have to make it back to new highs. And I know that's a lot to give up. I mean, I hear you. If it didn't have all that overhead supply, it's a nice move from lows. It's probably a bow tie. Or it will be soon. You know, that's almost a textbook bow tie soon on the first little down day. And you've got some Dave Light in there. I hear you. But I don't like the overhead supply. So, And, and I tend to pick things apart. So don't get uh, – don't worry about that. That's just my opinion. BRKS, too extreme, a TKO, or just a very poor earnings report, which just should be shouldn't be traded. All right, let's take a look at that. B R K S. That sounds like a semiconductor, right? Yeah, that's a little extreme. You know, I often say, let's back the chart out and see what we have. Now, I often say a TKO should stand out like a sore thumb. Well, that's worse than a sore thumb there, okay? Uh, and the problem here is it, it traded all the way back below its prior little peak. So that's no longer a TKO. Now, if this thing was in the mother of all uptrends and it made this type of move lower, let's just say point-wise lower, and it was higher in price or percentage-wise lower, however you want to look at that, and it was in a super-duper accelerating uptrend, then maybe that would be uh, tradable. But in this case, it pulled all the way back past its prior peak. So, yeah, let it go. Now, you you you, uh, you pointed out bad earnings, and, and the the best trades that I could think of – there was probably some bad news that came out, anti-fundamental or something, on the day that they made a nice TKO and set up. Getting back to the fundamental thing, one thing that I said a while back was in an interview, it's like one day I'm going to invent a system where I incorporate fundamentals. Now, before you gas, just realize that the second part of the system, the fundamental part, is that the stock has to have bad fundamentals. So I think if you combine good momentum with bad fundamentals, then you might have a system because that stock is trading without any concern of fundamentals whatsoever. It's trading in a pure technical manner. There's no reason why it's going up other than technically it is. Intel for Russ, probably not going to like it. Uh, Intel is a big, thick stock. Eh, it looks okay, though. It looks better than I thought it would. HV of 20. Um, it's broken out to new highs, maybe on a pullback. Okay, it might change my mind on that one, but 
I prefer stocks that make a little bit bigger move. Notice like that, uh, where was, um, there's one I'm looking at now. Let me go off screen and I'll tell you the HV on it. So there's another semiconductor I'm looking at. No, not so much bigger. Okay. Let's see what the Kim was. Yeah, Kim is now 112 in the HV. I don't know what it was. I can't plot and fly. I love telechart because I can look at a bunch of charts, but this it's like unlike Metastock, I can't just plot things on the fly. Um, but yeah, this is at 112. Now 112 is a little extreme, but you get the idea. Was well, OSK a TKO? Okay, Joe, let's take a look. Uh, technically, yes, but it needs to be a little bit, almost a little deeper in that TKO move. But let's take a look at like a two-day chart, three-day chart. If I can make it look. No, I can't make it combine like I want. But if the low, if if this low was like where this low is, then yes, okay. Um, again, HV a little bit on the low side. The problem with trading a lower HV stock is something bad can still happen. That's a reoccurring theme that I do. We are long DRNA, and uh, Andre wants to talk about it. Uh, this was a case where it was a little unorthodox in that it pulled back quite a few days. If you're looking for it, this is kind of a TKO move here. You can see I would call that a TKO, especially if you kind of blend these two bars together. Let's see if we do a two-day chart. Yeah, you can see on a two-day chart a little bit uh, more clearly. And I just kept telling everyone, you know, I know it's pulled back so many days, and I know my general rules say after eight to ten days, take them off the radar. But I just felt like it just looked like the mother of all bottoms was in place with this one. And that, and another one of those, let's take a view from 10,000 feet, okay? So uh, right now, let it make new highs and then trade pullbacks along the way. But I would not take it on as a new position. Okay, IO, IO. Uh, okay. My only concern here, let's let's just take a, a view from 10,000 feet. Got a little overhead to deal with at 30. You know what? If a stock doubles and hits some overhead, I'm okay with that. Volume is a little bit on the low side, a lot of bit on the low side. So volume super low. So I'd be careful there. My only concern is that this breakout was just a few bars, but it looks okay. So let's check back. Let's see if it pulls back maybe below 12 a little bit, but it can't pull all the way back to this prior peak. So it looks okay. I would definitely keep that on your watch list, but thin, 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 thin. So be super duper careful. You're welcome, Russ. Phil wants to talk about URA. That's going to have some um, volatility to it. Not as much as I thought. Uh, this is an ETF, obviously, uranium. I'm, I know what I was thinking about. I was thinking about U-R-R-E. No, that's no longer in existence. Did we sell it all to the Russians? <laughs> um, it would have to get above this overhead supply for me to become interested in it. What's some individual uranium names? I don't remember. U-R-E itself? No, the U-R-E. No, that's not it. Can anybody think of uranium on top of the head? CCJ, that's the one I was trying to think of. Or one of them. Oh, volatility is not that high there either. That's that's surprising. DNN, that's the one. That's crazy. Yeah, CCJ kind of looks like the ETF. So it would have to clear this overhead supp uh, supply. I have a love-hate relationship with uranium stocks, as one of my friends used to point out. You love them and they hate your account. But, man, when they move, they can move. UEC, yeah, that kind of looks like the other ones. That's another uranium. And then DNN. What happened to URE? Yeah, same sort of action here. But, you know, these things are just waking up. Now, this is a penny stock, but kind of a penny stock. But it's kind of getting interesting in here because you got this major long-term bottom. You could buy this stock and use a 50 cent stop. <laughs> now, you got to be careful because, uh, as I said a while back, they can reverse split you to death always on these penny stocks. And if you don't know what that is, you will someday if you buy a cheap stock and it doesn't take off.
UEC. Yeah, you know, same sort of action there too. Just has a ton of overhead supply to get through. Okay, Carlston wants to know about GGAL. GGAL is going to be a bank, foreign bank. And it looks okay. It's kind of hard for me to get excited about a bank. HV about 25. It's okay. This was on the Landry list not too long ago. You could certainly do much worse, but for me, I mean, I put it on the list because I thought it was interesting in that it, it made a nice move higher, nice little pullback, rallying out the pullback. Well, now it's rallying out of the pullback. But I just think that there's going to be something, maybe after today's slide a little bit, uh, a better opportunity out there than a bank. Did I do URA yet? Yeah, we did URA. NOG. Yeah, this is on the Landry list. I should have not pulled that up. You got me on that one, Howard. <laughs> Howard's not in a service, so he wouldn't have known that. I can't beat him up too much. Yeah, you know, this is kind of an S&G type of trade. It's kind of interesting. I do like the way it's taken off from lows. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback. With a transitional pattern, you don't always get the pullback. we got the bow tie working now. So, yeah, but just remember, it's going to be a super-duper speculative trade down around a buck a share. But, yeah, I like it a lot. Good job on that one. Try not to uh, – I forgot to – Right now, my landry list where we got started, put it in front of me at least. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this has got some longer term issues to it, and then it's also kind of spiked higher. Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing anything to get me excited here. Maybe if we want to make brand new highs, but I would leave that one alone for now. EC. Yeah, on a pullback, maybe. Nice breakout. Yeah, it's, still, it's at relatively low levels, at least historically. Yeah, absolutely. Put that on your watch list. I'm, I'm sure I have it on my watch list. But that's a nice breakout. Notice that you've got multiple days in the breakout. Notice it's persistent in its breakout. So, yeah, absolutely. All right, Aaron, take off, man. Good to see you. Thanks for coming, man. Appreciate it. PRGS. At first glance, this stock looks like it's losing some momentum in here. Let's throw a moving, moving average in just for S&Gs. See, when you take a look at the moving average, let's see if we can make it go away. Let me make the chart go away. There we go. You can see that the moving average is notice they're beginning to roll over. Okay. Now I could eyeball it. I wouldn't even bother putting the moving averages in. But if you're a little newer to trading momentum, throw the moving averages in after you take a look at the chart, especially if you like the chart and see what's happening. But it's not the end of the world. I mean, it could just be a bit of a correction. Uh, you know, maybe if it would do a knockout bar in here, like a big knockout bar, and it would be kind of uh, similar to a double top knockout, sort of a little bit like we had back here. See this little knockout move here? If this knockout move would have been bigger, I'd have been all over that one. But yeah, I would, at first glance, it's losing momentum. So I'd like to see maybe a shakeout, one last shakeout move. Selgin recently got beat up. CELG. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty ugly too. Here's the deal. Um, one thing that I strongly urge you to not do is if a stock is gapping down, especially after brand new highs, you need to completely avoid it. If you're long, make sure you're on your stop when that happens. I actually have a strategy called reversal gap strategy where you step number one, you need to gap down within 10 days of a brand new high. And then step number two, you need a little bit of a pullback. Okay. So that would have me really nervous and cautious if that occurred. And even if you did take a 10 point lick and then decide to get out, I mean, by, by that point, it's only 10% on this high price stock. So that's not the end of the world, but, but riding it down from, from there to all the way down to here, obviously that's, 
you know, now it's 30%. Now it's starting to get become a little bit more substantial. Okay, Rick wants to talk about PRGS, PRGS. Yeah, we just talked about that one, sorry. I didn't forget to. SLCA, Dave Light. Well, I'm glad that struck a chord with you, uh, card with you, Howard. Yeah, I'm never sure I'm never sure who I'm going to reach with this stuff. I mean, that's why you know, I submit especially when I submit something really simple like Dave Light to a um Proactive Trader Magazine, which is read by all these money managers, it's like, boy, I'm gonna, they're gonna think, oh, what an idiot. And then when Tom McClellan picks it up and puts it out, it gets pretty excited. I know, I'm just blowing my own horn. I guess there's a joke in that. Gotta be careful. Um, I'd like this better if it was coming off of major, major lows as opposed to kind of like mid range. Just not a big fan of stocks that set up in the middle of a range like this, a big picture range. Uh, I can't fault you shorter term. I hear you. It's beginning to take off, but I think I'd pass on that one. Right. Did we cover that one? It's funny. I can tell the different people by the stocks they pick. Um... Well, it's got a big gap down way back in 2015. I guess that's a long ways away. Nah, it's just kind of chopping around in here, and it's got an HV of 111. It's just a little too crazy, even by my taste. EC. Donald, you're next. Yeah, we talked about this one. Um, on a pullback, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. On a pullback. Q and ST. No, that looks a little crazy. It's a little on the thin side. I'd like to see some more follow through. You got one day of breakout here, just one day, and now it's kind of chopping around. It's okay. Gaps can be a good place for support. And support can be beautiful. I'm showing my age. You see all those commercials out? It's a young kid. Before the internet. <laughs> Pay careful attention to those. It's a bra commercial, in case you guys are wondering. Bra commercials today is much different. Uh, yeah, no follow through on this one. I hear you, though. Um, it would have to continue continue to break out, maybe get to the mid twenties and then pull back. It's okay, you know, maybe it's okay. Maybe uh, put it on your momentum list. Russ wants to know about TY or either that or saying thank you. Either way, TY. Uh, no, he must be saying thank you. F R T A. F or T A. He was saying thank you. You're welcome, Russ. Ah, uh, this one's kind of all over the place. It's got a little supply to deal with. Maybe if it got past supply, but it looks like a stock that has a lot of bad memories. Even though this next supply is way up here, I would be a little bit concerned about it. I mean, it's okay if it broke through that, but I think you could find something else with maybe clear air. Above it, CC. Uh, as a short, yes. But I, w I would not rush out and short it. But if you wanted to short it, yes, as a short. That's the explosion gap pivot. I think that's what I call it. Or no, reversal gap strategy. Notice you got a gap here after just a new high right here. And then your one bar pullback. So you would actually already be short this one. I don't see any reason to go after it and fight the overall big picture trend. But, yes, stock could be in the early phases of being in trouble. BA I'm probably not going to like. Too thick. Okay. HB of 15. 
lost a lot of momentum in here. Again, if you don't know whether a stock has lost momentum, throw your moving averages in. Eh, they're not that telling. All right, take that back and draw your line. Just draw your line, go back in time. You can see that it hasn't, oops, it hasn't made a whole lot of forward progress in a while. <laughs> Roku? Roku is kind of interesting in that obviously we've got a gap higher today um, and we would close. Let's take a look at the, I have a little pattern that uses a five day, believe it or not, moving average. So based on that pattern, you would be long by the close today, provided closes above this close here. My only concern is it's a little bit extreme on this gap. It's a pretty big gap. Given it's a 43% gap. Yeah, I'd pass just because this gap is too extreme. And the problem with a gap is it creates a disequilibrium when, it, when they're that when they're that big. So I would stay away from that one. CRZO, I think that's going to be an oil field stock. It looks okay, but not set up. And this is going to have some bad memories along the way. Yeah, maybe when it sets up, it might be worth a shot, but it's just not that exciting right now. Ren. Is this a Chinese stock? Longer term, it's got some issues. A lot of overhead supply, a lot of bad memories in this stock. I think I'd pass based on that. And then one thing that I don't like is this big, ugly bar. I'd like to see some distance between where the stock is and this crazy bar here, which is all the way up to here. Yeah, it's just it's just too crazy longer term. I'd leave that one alone. I think we're I think we're caught up. Yeah, this one's uh this one's kind of interesting. Maybe uh, uh Carlston, maybe on a little bit more pull back. Maybe I'll come see you next Oktoberfest, especially since I've been dieting and Drinking far less beer than I used to. Uh, yeah, and a little bit deeper pullback. It's a nice persistent breakout. It's pulling back a little bit. It needs a little bit more pullback. I think over the next few days, we should start should start seeing a lot of uh, interesting setups in the semiconductors. Yeah, we talked about this one. Okay, we talked about that one already, Rick. I'll get the I'll get everything loaded up as soon as I can, so you can watch the recording. Okay, well, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, obviously. I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I appreciate that very much. Any other answered questions, Dave at DaveLandry.com. If it's a question that requires thought, then I'll make it fodder for next week's show, and I do encourage that so I have something to talk about. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then, and hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. You're welcome, Russ and Jill and Carlson and Howard and Andre. I feel like I'm on Rapper Room. <laughs> All right. Good weekend, everyone. See you next week. Thank you so much.